Good morning. Thank you for joining with me and the people of King of Kings Lutheran Church as we worship together from our separate locations on this fifth Sunday of Lent. My name is Marie Duquette, and I'm blessed to be the pastor at King of Kings in Ann Arbor, a congregation committed to the work of mercy, justice, and inclusion. During this time when our nation is sheltering in so that we don't overwhelm our healthcare system and to support our heroic workers in the medical field who are working long hours to care for those most in need. I'll be coming to you from this location, which I am calling the King of Kings Cafe. Before we begin, you may want to have nearby a Bible, your red hymnal, if you have one, and something to write with if you are inclined to take notes. Even if you don't have a hymnal, this week we have added words to the screen for our closing hymn so that you can easily sing along. Also, if you are worshiping with us, please let us know by hitting like or commenting so that we will know who we are reaching. That will enable us to know who to contact in our congregation who might not yet know where to find us. Finally, I'd like to thank everyone who has helped us put this worship together, and especially Deb Bond, who has picked up the fragments you have submitted and woven them together to produce this hour of worship. Now, I invite you to take a few deep breaths as we listen to Steve Whiting's prelude and prepare our hearts for worship.
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who is present, who gives life, who calls into existence the things that do not exist. If you were to keep watch over sins, O Lord, who could stand? Yet with you is forgiveness. And so, together and collectively, we confess. Gracious God, have, have mercy, mercy on us. We, we confess, confess that we have turned away from you knowingly and unknowingly. We have wandered from your resurrection life. We have strayed from your love for all people. Turn us back to you, O God. Give us new hearts and right spirits that we may find what is pleasing to you and dwell in your house forever. Amen. Receive good news. God turns to you in love. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live, says our God. All your sin is forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, who is the free and abounding gift of God's grace for you. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son came into the world to free us all from sin and death. Breathe upon us the power of your Spirit, that we may be raised to new life in Christ and serve you in righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, you are one God, now and forever. Amen. Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very, very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. And he said to me, Prophecy to these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded. And as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophecy to the breath, prophecy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophecy, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. Hello. I'd like to invite the children to come up now, please. Kidding, come closer to your television or whatever you're watching on. Okay, first I wanna thank Molly Martinez for coloring these pages that Lael sent to her home and sending them in so that I could show them to you now. This one is The Good Shepherd and this one says, God, today I pray for. A reminder for us all to pray. Good job, Molly. If anyone else sends your work to Lael, I will show it on Sunday morning. Okay, so look what I have. I have macaroni. I love macaroni. Oh, you love it. Mm, mm, mm. But you know, I can't. Ah, it seems 
like something was missing from it. <laughs> Nala wants it. Hmm. Looks like something was missing from it. Water. Water. I should have put it in water and boiled it and drained the water off. And added butter and some milk and some cheese. That would really make this dry macaroni really good, wouldn't it? That would be macaroni and cheese, yum. This dry macaroni reminds me of the story that we just heard Kevin read. It was a story in the book of Ezekiel in the Bible. And in that story, God took Ezekiel and showed him a valley that was filled with dry bones. A whole valley that was filled with them. They were scattered all around. There was no life in them. And God said to Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel said, Lord, only you know the answer to that. And then God said to Ezekiel, speak to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Look, I'm going to put flesh and muscle on you, cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and make you come to life. So Ezekiel spoke the message to the bones, just as God said. And as he said, hear the word of the Lord, the dry bones started rattling all across the valley. They came together. They formed complete <coughs> skeletons. And then, <laughs> it is alarming, isn't it, Nala? Skeletons. And then flesh covered them, um, skin covered the bones. And finally, the winds came and they filled the bodies with this breath. Now look at this macaroni again. It's dry, hard, not very good at all. Nothing good can come of it is what we might think. If we did not know that if you add water, it will become something different, won't it? It will become something very good indeed. That's the way it is. When we face something that's really hard in our lives, like having to stay inside and not being able to go to school and do all the things we're used to doing. Sometimes it's hard to think that anything good can happen when everything feels like we're in a valley of dry bones. But just how we know that this macaroni, dried up as it is, can become good, we know that hard things in life can become a lot better. Just as God brought life to the Valley of the Dry Bones, with the breath of God's Spirit, God can make bad things better in our lives. In fact, that's what God does. So next, I'd like to say a prayer with you, and then I'm going to tell you about our next song. So please pray with me like this. Fold your hands. And I'm going to pause after each part of the prayer so you can repeat it. Okay? Let's pray. Dear God, Dear God, sometimes we face hard things. Sometimes we face hard things. And life seems hopeless. And life seems hopeless. Help me to remember that. Help me to remember that. If you can make dry bones live again, if you can make dry bones live again, you can make something good. You can make something good out of the hard things. Out of the hard things that are happening today. That are happening today. Amen. Amen. Good praying. Now about this song. This Bible story has helped so many people that a song was written about it. It's a song about how all of our bones fit together, you know, the wrist bone connect to the arm bone, right? All our bones fit together and how God 
puts people back together when they're falling apart. The chorus of the song is this. Oh, hear the word of the Lord. Sing it with me, please. Oh, hear the word of the Lord. One more time. Oh, hear the word of the Lord. Now we're going to listen to this song, and you might want to try to point to the bones as we hear people name them, and everyone come in on the chorus, which is, Oh, hear the word of the Lord. This song is called Dem Bones. <laughs> The ankle bone connected to the shin bone, the shin bone connected to the knee bone, the knee bone's connected to the thigh bone. Now hear the word of the Lord. The shoulder bones connected to the neck bone and the neck bones connected to the head bone. Oh Lord, we need that head bone. Now hear the word of the Lord. Today's Gospel comes from the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John, starting with the first verse. A certain man, Lazarus, was ill. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This was the Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped her feet with her, his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent word to Jesus saying, Lord, the one whom you love is ill. When he heard this, Jesus said, this illness isn't fatal. It's for the glory of God so that God's son can be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha, her sister and Lazarus. When he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was. After two days, he said to his disciples, let's return to Judea again. The disciples replied, Rabbi, the Jewish opposition wants to stone you, but you want to go back? Jesus answered, aren't there 12 hours in a day? Whoever walks in the day doesn't stumble because they see the light of the world, but whoever walks in the night does stumble because the light isn't in them. He continued, our friend Lazarus is sleeping, but I'm going in order to wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping, he will get well. They thought Jesus meant that Lazarus was in a deep sleep, but Jesus had spoken about Lazarus' death. Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. For your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you can believe. Let's go to them. Then Thomas said to the other disciples, 
Let us go too, so that we may die with Jesus. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was a little less than two miles from Jerusalem. Many Jews had come to comfort Martha and Mary after their brother's death. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him while Mary remained in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now, I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Martha replied, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She replied, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, God's son, the one who is coming into the world. After she said this, she went and spoke privately to her sister, Mary. The teacher is here and he's calling for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to Jesus. He hadn't entered the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were comforting Mary in the house saw her get up quickly and leave, they followed her. They assumed she was going to mourn at the tomb. When Mary arrived where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying also, he was deeply disturbed and troubled. He asked, where have you laid him? They replied, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to cry. The Jews said, see how much he loved him? But some of them said, but he healed the eyes of the man born blind. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was deeply disturbed again when he came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone covered the entrance. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man said, Lord, the smell will be awful. He's been dead four days. Jesus replied, didn't I tell you that if you believe you will see God's glory? So they removed the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. I know you always hear me. I say this for the benefit of the crowd standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. Having said this, Jesus shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his feet bound and his hands tied and his face covered with a cloth. Jesus said to them, untie him and let him go. This is the gospel of the Lord. It's a long gospel, isn't it? I read you 44 verses. It's kind of too bad it wasn't just a little bit longer. Because if it, I had kept going another 10 verses, I would have read that from this day forward, they plotted to kill him. In the Gospel of John, this event, raising Lazarus from the dead, is the turning point in which the chief priests and the Pharisees decide to kill Jesus. This is the point at which they say, oh no, raising people from the dead, bringing death, bringing life out of death, can't have that. It's interesting because if you go and you look at the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the turning point in those Gospels in which the powers that be decide that Jesus needs to die 
is when he cleanses the temple. He goes to the temple, which has been turned into a marketplace with animals all over that are being sold as sacrifices. He goes there and he turns those tables over. The only time in scripture we really see him losing his temper completely. And according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that is when they decide Jesus must die. But in John, no, it's bringing life out of death. Maybe it's both. He surely disrupted the economy and the status quo when he turned the tables over. Can't have that. He surely brought life out of death. Can't have that. Whichever one it really was, or maybe it was both, this is the point at which they decided to kill Jesus. But let's back up a minute. Let's not go there just yet. Let's unpack this story just a little bit. One of the things I always notice in the story of Lazarus is that when he gets word that Lazarus is sick, he waits two days. It has a verse all to itself. And you can't help but wonder, why? He's God. He knows what's coming. Why would he wait? And then if you keep reading, we see all kinds of things that we don't see anywhere else. Jesus cries. Cries. It's the only place in the whole Bible. You'd think if he was going to cry, it might be, I don't know, during the flogging? When he's beaten, hanging on the cross? But no, he cries here. And it's important to notice why. When Jesus saw Mary crying, and the Jews who had come with her crying also. He is disturbed and troubled. They are on their way to go to see where he has been laid. And Jesus began to cry. Jesus crying is linked to his compassion for Mary and the Jews who are comforting her, her and who also likely loved Lazarus. This is a moment in which we begin to understand that when Jesus is moved to tears, it isn't for himself. It's for us. It's for Mary. It's for people who are suffering. It's for people who are crying. There's a lot of emotion in this story. We heard about grief, despair, doubt. Is he sick or is he dead? Is Jesus coming or is he not? Do you believe or do you not? Anger, the word that it that is um, translated as disturbed, Jesus was deeply disturbed and troubled when he saw Mary crying. That word in the original Greek is also the word that is translated as anger. And several times in this story, the original uh, Greek uses a word for anger. Jesus is angry. About what? About the fact that the path to life everlasting includes death and suffering? Is that what he's angry about? Is he, is he angry because this is something that people that he cares about and people he loves have to go through? That this is part of what it means to be alive? Anger. And the last thing I noticed was fear. He's been dead four days. The smell will be awful. Would you be afraid? I would be. I'm a queasy person, but I would be afraid. Was there any fear about for it on Jesus' part here? What's going to happen? What if the beta test on resurrection doesn't work? Was that part of it? And the reason that I bring all this up is because we are going through a time, are we not? 
This coronavirus is the most unpredictable, anxiety-producing, frightening thing I've ever experienced. I've talked to people in their 90s who say the same thing. This is something we have not all lived through before. And so we've been reading and we notice that we are all, as we go through this, in different parts of grief. And all the stages of grief are in this story. Bargaining was the first one. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Despair. Doubt. Anger. Fear. This is what it means to love. This is what it means to live. That we worry about one another out of compassion and we get to go through all of these emotions. Maybe you felt one or two lately. I don't know. So I guess where this leaves me today is I think we might be called to consider what does resurrection look like right now? I mean, we know that even though we are followers of Jesus, people still die. No one gets a bypass around death. And we know death does not have the final say, but we don't always know what that looks like. And so what might resurrection look like right here, right now, and in the days and weeks and months ahead. What does resurrection look like when it's all wrapped up in bandages? When its face is hidden by a mask? When it needs others to step up and finish the work of healing? What does resurrection look like when churches are empty and people are trying to find their friends online. And sometimes the internet goes down and brownouts happen. What does resurrection look like when different people get different treatment for the same disease because of politics? What does resurrection look like for you? It's still unfolding. We need to lean into it. I can tell you that I have received more letters, stamped mail, emails, text messages on our website, text messages on our Facebook page, on my phone. In the last couple of weeks, from people who have discovered our church online or people who have discovered the food pantry that we keep on our property, that the people of King of Kings are working so hard to keep stocked because it's almost emptied every day. The neighborhood is using the food. People are finding out about the work that this body of Christ does more than any time since I've been here, almost four years now, and the church is empty. That's worth chewing on, don't you think? What does resurrection look like now? This story ends with the verse that says, untie him and let him go. You might say, that every one of us for the moment has been untied. Untied from things we did every day, from places we went every single day, from responsibilities that we thought we could not possibly do any other way. We have been untied from our routines. Some people have been literally let go from their source of income. And suddenly, 
all of us are looking at is what is happening and by and large what I see what I hear is this how do we help who needs this food have you talked to have you heard about will you pray for could we do this let's get the word out what does resurrection look like now? From where I am watching and participating in this time of history, resurrection looks like suddenly noticing what we've been overlooking for a long time. People who couldn't come to church unless we made it available in a different way. People who needed our food and we were motivated to make sure that pantry was always stocked, not just when we came to church. From where I am observing this and experiencing it, there's fear, there's anger, there's sorrow, there's tears, and there's resurrection, and this is not the end of the story. Death does not have the final say. This story is still being written. Jesus Christ is in our midst. We have been untied. And I'm pretty interested to see where Jesus will lead us and where we will see resurrection in this new way that we have been set free.
now, let us lift up our voices, thoughts, and hearts in prayer. After each prayer, we will say, God of mercy, and the response is, hold us in love. Let us pray. Turning our hearts to God, who is gracious and merciful, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of life, bind your faithful people into one body. Enliven the church with your spirit and bless the work of those who work for its renewal. Accomplish your work of salvation in us and through us for the sake of the world. God of mercy, hold, hold us, us in love. love. God of life, you love the world you have made and you grieve you when creation suffers. Restore polluted lands and waterways. Heal areas of the world ravaged by storms, floods, wildfires, droughts, or other natural disasters. Bring all things to new life. God of mercy, Hold us in your love. God of life, show redemption to all who watch and wait with eager expectation. Those longing for wars to cease. Those waiting for immigration paperwork to finalize. Those seeking election. And those in dire need of humanitarian relief. Come quickly with your hope. God of mercy. Hold, Hold us, us in, in love. love. God of life, you weep with those who grieve. Unbind all who are held captive by anxiety, despair, or pain. Fill us with compassion and empathy for those who struggle. And keep us faithful in prayer. God of mercy, hold, hold us, us in, in love. love. God of life, we give thanks for opportunities for this congregation to collaborate with our community in caring for the needs of our neighbors. Strengthen our ties with other local congregations, agencies, and services. God of mercy, hold, hold us, us in, in love. love. Now, Lord, we'd like to lift up to you in prayer those on our long-term prayer list. Ima, Harv, Emily, Charlotte, Addie, Chris, and their family and friends. Pastor Lisa, Sandy, Jessica, Sorellis Maria, Cindy, Shane, Jessica, Clark, Karen, Anne, Daniel, Lloyd, Bob, Melissa, Michael, John, Jody, and her daughter, Dennis, Letty, Rob, Karina, Arlene, Jesse, Jim and Nancy, Rose, all those serving in the military, Ian and Bethany, Julia, and Diamond. God of mercy, hold, hold us, us in, in love. love. God of life, you are our resurrection. We remember all those who have died and trust that in you, they will live again. Breathe new life into our dry bones that we too might live with you forever. God of mercy, hold, hold us in love. love. According to your steadfast love, O oh God, hear these and all our prayers as we commend them to you. Through Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you sweet peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.